Hello everybody, it's Heath Robinson back here again with world traveler and photographic professional Joel Wolfson to present Keeping It Natural with Topaz plugins. Welcome everyone, I always love doing these webinars with Topaz and uh, I'll say excuse me ahead of time in case I uh, cough or clear my throat. As Heath mentioned, it's that time of year and uh, I seem to be fighting a cold bug or something. So thanks to everyone for joining us today, and a special thanks to those of you in faraway time zones. Today our theme is keeping it natural. So what does that really mean, and, and why is it important? Well, when we see something beautiful and we capture it with our camera, we want to convey that to the viewer. But because cameras can't interpret what, it, uh, what they see the way our brains do, we have to compensate and adjust our images so they convey the feel of being there, or in the case of a portrait, you know, communicate the essence of that person or animal. And what I've seen a lot, and I guess probably more with nature shots than other ones, is just that people get carried away with the saturation and other controls, and then the image ends up being kind of jarring instead of conveying a feel of being there. So I'll show you how some of my uh, bread and butter plugins like Detail, Clarity, Black and White Effects, and uh, Remask make it easy to keep it natural. So I'll start, I'll start with an easy image and we'll work our way through a couple more to some requiring a few more techniques. But just remember that our goal through this whole thing is to have an impactful image but keep it natural looking. And before we jump into it, I just want to mention that I have a number of educational resources by way of my blog and my newsletter and archives um, of these webinars, articles, and that sort of thing. And if you want to make the best use of it, um, the thing to do is get on my email list and you can do that at my website at joelwolfson.com and at the end of the webinar Heath will provide uh, my contact information again. So we're going to start in Lightroom, that's my main hub and launching point for working with images and the image I want to start with is here. So this is, um, this is a pretty simple shot and I shot it in the southwest of France. I was staying in this neighborhood for a few weeks earlier this year and every morning I'd go to the boulangerie with my daughter to get bread and coffee and of course hot chocolate for her and so I got to see it in the beautiful morning light every day. However, there was only one day with these really nice painterly clouds so I decided to shoot it. There were also these birds flying around so I just waited for one of the birds to get in position for my shot. So what I want to show you is where, where this started, and this is, this is where the shot started. So this is from the raw image, and as I often say, raw is blah, and this is no exception, but it really doesn't take a lot of time or work to bring it back um, to this, which is the way the image looked to me when I saw it, and, and basically to get across the feel of it. So let's start with our... Uh, our base image here that, that comes from the raw out of the camera. And what I, th there's a number of ways to go into this uh, from Lightroom. You can, uh, you can right click, um, you can go up under photo and say edit in, and we'll go into Photoshop. Now, the reason I'm going into Photoshop is because I want to make use of layers. And my little rule of thumb here, for those of you that haven't heard it before, is if you're going to use more than one plugin, or even if you're going to use one plugin more than one time, it's nice to have the flexibility that layers affords you, so that's why I use Photoshop. If you're just using, you know you're only going to use one plugin, there's no reason not to jump into it right from Lightroom, which fortunately Topaz allows you to do. So the first thing I'll do, the layout I have here, by the way, for Photoshop, my tools are on the left and my panels are on the right, and my layers are in the lower right here. So the first thing I'm going to do is duplicate my background. And I just make a habit of doing that because I want to preserve the original image and so that way I'm working on a copy of it essentially in a new layer. And I'm a big fan of relabeling the layers with what we're going to do. So basically we're going to go into clarity and my mission here, and I'll just make a little note of it here, is we're basically just going to op whoops, optimize the raw file if I can type. And the other thing I'm probably going to do is adjust uh, some color like the sky for instance and probably just work on some of the other colors so I'll just say saturation anyway I just do this as a reminder to what I did if I have to go back to it later so I'll go up to the filter menu at the top 
go down to Topaz Labs, and then go down to Clarity here. Well, this will jump into Clarity now. So this is the Clarity plugin, and the first thing I'm going to do is reset. And that's in the, if you look in the lower right of your screen, I hit the reset button here, and I, I just make a habit of doing that. What happens is uh, the plugin, and this is true of most plugins, it will remember your settings from your previous session, and this is quite convenient if you're doing multiple images in a similar, you know, with similar characteristics. Uh, but I just like to start from scratch, and and uh, if I didn't happen to be working on a similar image, this gets us back to neutral ground. So quick overview here. On the left-hand side, we have collections. So these are the collections on top, and those are collections of presets. So right now I have my collection selected, and these are all the presets I have in my collection. And as you click on them, they'll apply it to the image. So <clears throat> on top, we have navigation controls. And then over on the right, we've got our little navigator window uh, or histogram if we want it. And below that are the controls themselves. Now, the real power of this program is this panel here called Dynamics um, under, the, under the major heading Clarity. So Dynamics and actually Tone Level too. And essentially, Clarity is a contrast program. And I use Clarity on almost every image that I do. It really, by allowing you this really tightly control um, controlled options for contrast from micro through high contrast, you can really get a nice sense of depth. And it really, I used to do these complex actions in Photoshop uh, with multiple steps and, and uh, you know, using different modes. And it was, kind of, it was kind of complex. This really simplifies it. It's a lot faster. It's a lot easier. And um, it's just nice and simple to understand and use. So it starts with micro contrast, which is just um, areas where one pixel doesn't have much difference in contrast from the other, so very minute differences in contrast. And they're pretty well labeled, going up through low, medium, and high contrast. And by adjusting these sliders, you can you know, get various effects. So let me, I'll zoom in just so you can see. So we'll go to one-to-one -to -one here. And, and you know, if you haven't used this program before, you can just play around with these sliders. I'll move it all the way to the right so you can see what it does. You know, that's overdoing it. We're already getting into the, like, sort of grunge territory here. And really what I'm looking for is a more subtle increase in contrast. So that's the micro contrast slider. And I'm just going to move all these up just a little bit, um, the micro, the low, and the medium. And what I'm looking for here is just to kind of tweak um, that that sense of depth. So um, I can you can click up here to look at what your original is and then look at the processed version. So that's the after. A shortcut to that is the spacebar key. So if I hold down my spacebar, there's my before image. And I'm holding this down a little extra long because I know there's probably a delay on your end. And there's, there's my after image. So right there, we've already got a nice sense of depth. Um, a lot of times when you add contrast, you're increasing the darkness and the lightness. Let me go back to our overall view. And so what happens is by the time you get to the high contrast slider, most of the time I'm going to put that, or you know, in general, you're probably going to put that more in a negative direction. And um, it isn't going to have a big effect. And in, in this image, we don't have a, um, super bright whites and super dark darks. But uh, let me see if I if I go back to zero, you can you can see a little difference in there. So when I when I take the highest contrast areas and bring them to a negative, it brings back our shadow detail a little bit. Like if you look up under this overhang, so that's pretty good now. Um, there, the only other thing I might do is what's nice is this tone level thing. So after you go through here and adjust all this contrast, um, sometimes um, because you've increased contrast. You, you need to bring back your shadows a little bit. So I usually boost the black level just a bit. So I'll just bring it up here maybe in the sort of 15-ish range. And, and if you see in, in this overhang here, you can see where it brought the shadow detail back a little bit. And I think that's, that's probably looking pretty good. The other nice control in, along the right here is if you go down to hue, saturation, and lightness, you can tweak 
your colors a little bit. Now generally when I'm optimizing raw image I bring the overall saturation up just because that's one of those areas where whoops, I'm on the hue. My apologies. Let me zero that out. I go to the saturation button here in the middle and then go down here and bring the overall up to I usually do it around seven or eight for um, sort of reviving a raw image. I mean raw images have to be processed. They come out of the camera looking very lackluster and certainly not like what you saw when you were there. So now we're really close to to having this image back to the way it felt when I shot it and still maintaining a natural look to it. The only other thing I want to do is some more adjustments in this hue saturation and lightness. So um, one thing is the sky. The sky to me is looking a little bit cyan and not so not as blue as it should. And so what I'm going to do is go to the hue slider here and then here's my blue slider. And if you want to make sure you're on the right slider, just move it to one extreme or the other. And you can see, now I don't want a purple sky and I don't want a cyan sky. But I want to take some of that cyan out. So I'm just going to tweak it. Just move it a little bit to the right and bring a little bit of that blue hue back. And now I'll go to saturation. And when the light was hitting this facade in the morning, it, it it was direct sunlight, so it just had a little more vibrance to it. And so I'm going to use the saturation control. And instead of doing the overall, I don't want everything to get saturated. Um, I'm just going to do it individually by color. So um, this facade is kind of orange, and these outlines on the windows are kind of reddish. So I'm going to bump the orange saturation up a little bit to, um, oh, just maybe five or six or somewhere in there, just a little bit to kind of bring back the color that I remembered. And the red is going to affect around the windows. Again, I can bring it to an extreme and you can see that it's just isolating those reddish colors, but obviously I'm just looking for a more subtle touch here. So somewhere in this range, just around 10-ish. So the only other thing that I see here that I'd like to do is the sky was a little more blue than this. And this is a fairly common thing, right? The sky is um, generally a much brighter value than something you're shooting outdoors, and so it's fairly common that we want to darken our skies. Now most people are going to run to the saturation control. I personally, I like to go to the luminance, which is the brightness, and just bring down the brightness of the blue. And again, you can see, you know, we're making sure that we're in the right area. Um, and I'm just going to bring it down just a hair, like maybe 9, 10, somewhere in there. And now, to me, this all, this all looks natural. So, and, and it's also the feel of it. Remember, we're trying, to, we're trying to have an impactful image and get the feel of what it was like, but keep the thing looking natural. So I'm going to hold down the space bar. There's our before, the sort of lackluster raw as it comes out of the camera. And there's my after, which is the way this thing felt when I looked at it. So I'm going to say OK. And as you can see, that was pretty simple. We have, we have almost all the controls we need right there in Clarity. And I'll, it, it's here in this layer. If you click on the eyeball in Photoshop, that turns off that layer. So this will give us a little before, and there's an after. Now there's only one more thing that I really want to do with this, and that's to sharpen it. Now in the old days, for a sharpening workflow, I would always you know, advocate that people start with sharpening as their first step, the capture sharpening. So for those of you that don't know, in a, in a, ca in a sharpening workflow, you do capture sharpening, which is meant to recover what's lost in the, in the process of capturing an image itself. So most cameras have an anti-aliasing filter that reduces the image quality and just, just things from the electronics and that sort of thing. Um, you just lose a little sharpness through the whole process. Even if your camera doesn't have an anti-aliasing filter, which this one doesn't, I, I like to use cameras that don't have them, um, you, you still lose a tiny bit of sharpness. So what I'm going to do is duplicate this layer, and I'm going to use Command-J, which would be Control-J on a PC. I'm going to relabel it, and we're going to call this Detail, which is a good way to do your capture sharpening. And to finish up on that sharpening workflow, after you do capture sharpening to recover what was lost from the camera or a scanner, if you're scanning an image, then the next thing is called um, selective sharpening or creative sharpening. And that's just if you want to add a little extra sharpening to specific areas to uh, supplement what's already there. 
uh, and then you use output sharpening for whatever kind of output you're doing. And the, and the last one is just more math. So I'm going to do detail and I'm going to say sharpen because we're just going to do an overall capture sharpening here. And this is pretty easy. You go into filter, Topaz Labs. We're going to go into detail. And for, I'll show you here, the interface is very similar to what we saw in Clarity. If you haven't seen these before, the interface is pretty similar in all of these. So again, we have uh, collections on the left. I can click on Joel's collection here, and there are some of my presets. And then the, cr the controls are on the right. So the, the crux of this um, program, it's going through all the previews there, uh, is, is the detail enhancement. So it divides into small, medium, and large, and then when, with, within each of those you have a boost where it deals with the uh, lesser affected details in that category. So in, a, in essence, you have six adjustments, and then you can even break it down to shadow and highlight if you want to affect, say, just the small details and just the highlights, you can do that. So pretty powerful program. But for capture sharpening, all, most of the time all I ever use is the small detail slider, and you, you generally want to look at your sharpening at 100%. And typically for a camera without an anti-aliasing filter, I'm right at about 20. And that just brings back some of that detail that was lost. You don't want to over, overdo the details or it starts to look a little too crunchy. So there's my before, and there's my after, and you can see it brought back some of the detail. And then I always like to look at these um, at 50% too, just to make sure, because that's... 50% is going to be sort of a screen equivalent of scrutinizing a large print. So if I hold down the before key, it's going to be subtle on your end, um, looking at it over the internet and all that, and there's the after, but you can still see the effect. And I'm going to say okay, and that's pretty much it. We're done. So let's hop back into Lightroom, and I'll do a before and after for you here. And there we are. We This is uh, pretty basic thing. It, it took me much longer to explain it than it would to do it. It's probably about a you know three to five minute process to just optimize uh, a raw capture to get it back to the way we want it to look and the way it felt when we shot it. All right, so let's uh, let's move on to a different type of image. And for the next image, what I'm going to do is a people shot. I must have hit something here. There we go. So I shot this in New York when I was there about six weeks ago, and I shot this on the street. It was kind of a rainy and dark day, actually, and this woman had a great face, and I noticed when she smiled, you could really see the smile in her eyes. So I, I did this very tight portrait highlighting those smiling eyes. The problem we have with modern cameras and lenses is, is they're so good, really, that you see every detail. So portraits of people usually need some work to bring back a natural look so that we're not distracted by things the camera sees that we don't notice when we're looking at a person. So I'll show you where this started, and that's here. And you can see, now if you, if you look at this woman and you just met her, you'd say, wow, she has great skin, and you, know, you wouldn't even notice any of these lines or every pore on the skin, and unless you know somebody pretty well, you're not going to get close enough to see this stuff anyway. Um, she did allow me to shoot a tight portrait, and if you're wondering what, what the red in the skin is, she's not sunburned, she's, it's a rainy day and she's under a red umbrella, so the red umbrella is casting the red on her face, and uh, so in addition to uh, you know, cleaning up the lines and things that are distracting us from the essence of the person, um, we've also got this, you know, these uh, red tones, and so there's it's kind of exacerbated, the, the different colors are sort of exacerbating the issue of kind of showing things that are distractions and not really the essence of that person that we're trying to capture. So the first thing I'll do is take a, um, well, we're going to bring it into Photoshop and then we'll go from there. So that'll be my launching point because I'm going to use black and white effects and, um, and another plug-in and you'll see in a minute what I'm going to do here. So as usual, the first thing I want to do is make a copy of the background. There's many ways to do this. You can drag and drop it onto the dog ear. You can do Command or Control J, 
and we're going to go into black and white effects. Now, I could, I could try to work on the issues of the extra detail in the skin that are distracting us from the portrait itself, uh, but the reason I'm going into black and white effects first is by converting it to black and white, we are going to get rid of a lot of the issues we have right off the bat, and that just makes less work for us later on. So part of the whole thing I do with plugins is just trying to figure out the most efficient way to do things. The whole advantage of plugins is that they save us time and they make things easier. So I'll go into Topaz Labs, we'll go into black and white effects, which is my go-to for converting to black and white. And black and white effects prepares previews before you go in. So I'm going to reset. And, and what, what it starts out with is a neutral grayscale, and this is actually um, a pretty great starting point. Normally, like especially if I'm doing a landscape or architecture or some kind of scene, nature shot maybe, uh, my, the classic is my go-to. So again, we have the same kind of layout here where we have um, collections on the left. Um, we have the actual presets for each collection below that. Um, up above we have navigation and on the right we have tools and I'll be going through a couple of these tools here too. So just for the heck of it I'll click on the classic so you can see what that looks like. It just, in my opinion, it just doesn't work for a portrait like this. Um, it's it's um, accentuating the differences in tonality and exposure and, and in this case we actually want to go the other way and kind of smooth those out. So we've gone a long way just by converting it to black and white in a neutral grayscale to getting rid of some of those distractions. So here I'll hold down the space bar, there's the before, the color image, and there's the black and white, and you can see what a big difference that makes just converting it to black and white. So over on the right um, we have our preview window, and these red buttons are, are a quick way to apply filters and they work just like a glass filter would on a camera in the old days with film and if you're not used to using filters essentially what they do is they transmit or lighten the color that you select and they will block or darken the opposite on the color wheel so yellow and blue are opposites and red and green are opposites and whatnot now what it's doing is that the cool thing about black and white effects it's using the color information so you can make use of that and this woman is Caucasian, well, sort of. I think she was Portuguese or Brazilian Portuguese, I believe. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. It works with a lot of different ethnicities in terms of skin color um, using this little trick, and that is um, applying a yellow filter. Now, normally we think of doing that for a landscape, and a yellow filter would darken a blue sky in a landscape, but it also um, lightens the tones. So I'm going to click on that. You can see when I add the yellow filter, um, it kind of evens things out exposure wise so um, if I and you notice when I do that down below it opens up the color filter palette here so that if I want to tweak that I can increase or decrease the strength of it so I can bring up the strength and make it lighter I can bring it down but the default I think was was pretty good but if I t if I uncheck that you can see the difference that's no yellow filter and that's a yellow filter and you can see it's lightening those areas. Now I'm going to um, take this a step further too in a minute. I just want to go through the interface real quick for you here. So um, below that are just quick adjust buttons for contrast, brightness, um, that sort of thing, and below that are toning. You know, you can, you can do an instant tone on this if you want to. I'm going to keep it on the neutral. And then, you, then there's all different controls here, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, if you check back in my archives of, of webinars, I did one called All About Black and White, and you can see a lot more detailed use of this. But the main thing I want to do here was, was mainly the conversion and adding this yellow filter, and we've done most of the work just by doing that. Now, if you remember, here's the color image, her eyes are brown, and if you look at these tones, they're really kind of orangish. So maybe you know where I'm going with this is instead of a yellow filter, I can use an orange filter, and what's going to happen is it should brighten up the, the irises in her eye and delineate it a little bit more from the pupil. So if I do that, you can see 
Um, the skin even looks a little better, and we've instantly gotten some delineation in the eyes. So think about using those filters. And like I say, it works on a lot of different ethnicities. I've, um, I was just doing some the other day. It worked well on uh, portraits I had of black people, of Asian people. So you know, just give it a try. It kind of depends on the lighting and all that sort of thing. But it's a, it's a nice little tool to have in your, uh, in your pocket for these things. So um, the only other thing I want to do here is um, the, the whites of the eyes are a little bit muddy, so I want to bring those up. And I, although I could do it in another program, I'm going to do it here in black and white effects. So they have this down here, there's all these other palettes. And this one called Local Adjustments is kind of nice. It has a lot of different adjustments that you can brush in. Um, you can dodge and burn and add detail and smooth things and all that all selectively with a brush. So I'm going to leave it on Dodge. For those of you that don't know, that, that lightens things. Burn makes it darker. So I'm going to leave it on the Dodge tool. And what I'm going to do is adjust my brush size here. So let's see. Well, first I'm going to magnify it so you can see what I'm doing. So I'll just do one eye at a time. Now, when I bring it up, when I bring it up this large, of course, you're not going to see this much detail when you're looking at a print. You can start to see some noise in the image. Amazingly, I shot this at a 10,000 ISO, so <laughs> something I never would have dreamed of with film. But even at 10,000, that really isn't a lot of noise. And if and if we knock down that, knock it down to 50%, you can see that's more what it would look like if you were sticking your nose right up to a really large print. So here we are at 10,000 ISO, and there's virtually no visible noise. So what I want to do is lighten the whites of the eyes here. I'm going to leave the opacity low here. It defaults to 25. The hardness is just a feather edge like it is with any other brush tool. And the edge aware is just that. It detects edges. And the higher number you set it, the, the um, more sensitive it becomes to an edge. I don't, I'm not going to go up to 100% just because there is a little noise in there and I don't want it to be to dis distinguishing a dark pixel from a light pixel. So I'm going to actually let me bring, I'm going to bring the overall strength up just so you can see this a little better. And that overall strength thing is pretty nice because it allows you to take your overall effect up and down. Now I'm not worrying too much about um, spilling into another part of the eye here because I can always erase that out. In fact, I'll sort of purposely overdo it here and I'll show you how you can how you can get that out. So now what I do is go to the eraser tool. Um, now I'm going to bring the edge aware up because I want a little more of an edge there. And I'll go back to the pupil here and you can see I'm erasing where I kind of went over on that. And by keeping the bullseye of this thing on her iris of her eye, um, it's reading that tone, and even though the brush is spilling over into the white, you notice it's not erasing it. And that's where that edge aware really comes in handy. So I, I may have gone over just a little bit here, a little bit on her eyelid, a little bit on the eyelid here, and let's zoom back so you can see both eyes. And you can see now the whites are a lot brighter. Now what this overall strength does is after I've done this brushing, I can move it up or move it down. Now at 100 if I bring it down to the lowest, it's back to zero. Um, it's too high up at, you know, up at a uh, hundred percent. So I think probably somewhere, you know, in the forty-ish percent, something like that. So there we are. Um, we've we've pretty much taken care of a lot of what we're going after here to to give it a more natural look. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the only Sorry, the only uh, other thing I'm seeing is we still need to work on the skin. So I'm going to do that, create another layer here. So we'll duplicate this layer. And I'm getting sound effects I don't want. There we go. And I'm going to relabel this um, detail. Now, you're probably wondering why the heck is Joel going into detail when we want to smooth the skin not add detail to it. And you'll see it, so, it sounds counterintuitive, but this is actually um, a really great use of this plugin. So another one of my little tricks here. Not every, 
you don't always think of this. I have shown it before, I think, in another webinar that I did on, on uh, photos, you, you know, correcting photos of people. So the first thing I'm going to do is reset it. And what I'm going to do here is actually go to negative detail. So I'll bring the small details down here. Let me enlarge this a little bit so you can see what's going on. And then I'm going to take the medium details and bring that all the way down. And then the large details, if I bring it all the way down, it totally blurs it out. I'm going to bring it oh, most of the way, maybe in the 50% range, uh, just because we don't really need it quite that smeared. We still have, and, and it's not going to look like this when we're done. You'll see what I'm going to do in a minute. So this is going to be underneath, and then we're going to selectively brush it back in. So now I say, okay, we've actually used detail in the negative direction to get um, smoothing in there. And I'm going to go down, if you look in the lower right here on your screen, um, I'm hovering over this layer mask, and I'm going to hold down my Option key. If you're on a PC, it would be Alt, and click. And what that does is it added a mask that's completely black. So with masks, White reveals, black conceals, the whole thing is black, it's concealed everything we just did. And now we're going to go over on the left to the brush tool, come down here, make sure that we have white in the foreground, and that will allow us to brush things back in. Now I'm going to go up here to the upper left on the screen and just adjust the opacity of my brush to about 30%, because I just want to gradually brush this back in. Now for those of you that don't know this trick, uh, if you hold down the Option and Control key on your keyboard, or Alt Control on a PC, and you click your mouse, if you move left and right, you change the size of the brush. This is in Photoshop. And if you go up and down, you change the um, softness of the edge, the feather. So I'm going to go maybe this size with the brush. And we're at 30%, so it's not going to bring it back in 100%. So I'm just going over her eyelid here to just kind of what we're doing is is just slowly revealing very gradually the softening that we just did. So yeah, I mean you can see every pore in your skin here and you know like I said if you want it to look natural we don't we don't want to see that because that's not the way we see people. On the other hand I don't want to overdo this. This isn't for a Cosmo cover you know of a model to hide every single flaw there is. Um, this is a real portrait of a real person so um, I'm just kind of gradually going over this. And this is, you know, this is all a judgment call. You can do as much of this as you want. And you notice that I, I basically overdid it when I was in detail. And, and I'll often do that on purpose just because I have the option of gradually brushing it back in. So it's better to have a little too much than have to go back in and redo your, your softening or sharpening or whatever it is that you want to brush back in. So I'm just kind of going around her face here and and just smoothing out some of these areas here. And I don't want to go into the eyes much because, you know, that's sort of the crux of this whole portrait. And we want to, we want to keep detail in the eyes. Um, I'm just trying to get rid of, you know, seeing every little pore and every little, um, every little thing. So, and up here, you know, Again, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do the Cosmo thing and get rid of all these lines because people do have lines in their face. It's just natural, but it's the whole idea of the feel of it. And and the nice thing about this too is we have it in a layer. Um, we have this mask. You can always come back to it, and you can change your brush to the black and mask more out if you want to bring some of the detail back, or vice versa. You can just come in and brush more in, and that's the reason I use a low opacity brush. So one more thing I'll do here and that is I'm going to make another layer. Here let me uh, let me show you how I do this. So I have this whole stack. What I want to do is create a new layer from the stack so I have all the effects together. So you hold down the option or alt key, click on this menu and say merge visible and that creates a new layer based on all the previous ones. And all I'm going to do is go right back into detail. And now I'm going to add just a little more detail to her eyes um, just to make them stand out a little bit. Again, we're going for how we perceived this person or whatever it is we're shooting originally. Uh, let me reset this because we still have all our blur stuff in there. 
So what I'm going to do now is actually I'm going to use a preset. So I'll go to the top one here, Creative Detail Collection. And if I click on this grid, and this is true of most of the Topaz plugins, where you can set up a grid and it shows all, different, all those different presets with a little sample of how they look. And I'd say the overall detail medium is a good place to start. And remember, we just want to concentrate on what we're seeing in the eyes because we're going to mask everything else out. So I'm just going to say, OK, jump back into Photoshop. We're going to do the very same thing, go down here and create a mask. I'm going to relabel this just so I have detail. We're going to call this eyes. And then I go back with my brush, and this time I think I'm going to go a little higher because I don't, it doesn't have to be so gradual this time. So I'll use a 50% brush and then just start brushing in. Whoops, i got to switch my to the white there so that I can reveal. And as I, <clears throat> let's see here. I'm not on the mask, that's my problem. Okay. So th this is an important thing, and I, <laughs> I'll point it out since I just made a mistake here on it, is um, the little outline you see, that's selecting either the image itself or the mask, and we're working on the mask. So we want to make sure we have the mask selected, make sure we're on the white foreground color, make sure we have the brush selected, and up, up in the upper left here, I'm at 50% opacity on the brush. Now I can start start brushing the detail back in. And you can see as I do this, um, I'm just mainly going for the eyelashes here. I might do a little bit around the irises and the pupil here just to bring those out. And her right eye is just slightly less sharp than the left eye, so I'm going to brush in a little bit more over here just to make those kind of stand out equally. And there we are. So if I go back over to my layers palette and I unclick that, that's the before on just the eye sharpening only. It, it is somewhat subtle, but it does improve it. Um, this is our whole starting point right here. And if we go back to, whoops, sorry, to our finishing point, there it is there. And let's just hop back in the Lightroom and do a before and after so you can see. And there we are. So there's our starting point with the color image and actually too much detail, you know, that's, that's the drawback of the modern cameras, and then over on the right, which is a, a nice natural looking portrait. All right, so now we'll go to a different image. And what I want to do next, this one is going to take a little bit more technique. Let's... Uh, Select these. So this is my next image, and this is in Tuscany, and this is the view from the village where I base my Villages of Tuscany workshop. And by the way, we still have one or two spots open if anybody wants an excuse to have a great time in Tuscany. But you only see this view if you get up before dawn, and that's when I shot this, before the sun actually came up. I've shot this valley several times over the years, and it helps to go often to get just the right mist and light. And in this case, I wanted to communicate the feel of dawn with this villa and the village in the background even to just waking up. You know, the lights are on, things are just coming to life, and it's this villa just feels nice and warm in this cool mist very early in the morning. These are working farms, and uh, some of them are agriturismos. So people are generally up early, and I just like that really warm feel of the villa floating in the cool mist. Um, I'll show you the I'll show you the one that I started with, and that's here. So this is the the raw capture out of the camera, and the challenge here is to maintain that feel. So aside from the raw is blah syndrome that we have in this, um, it's going to require some selective adjustments to communicate that feel and still help it look natural. So. Because what we want to do is that there's, it looks really flat right now. There isn't a lot of life to it, so to speak, and certainly not the way it looked if you were standing there. And there's, you know, there's a lot of texture in these farm fields, uh, and I want to bring that back. However, we're probably going to need to do more of that in the background because the mist is just kind of a blanket here, and there's really a lot of texture and detail in there to be had, and you'll see that when I go into this. So 
what I'm going to do to isolate that is use Remask, which is an awesome program, and that's definitely my go-to for um, for masking. So I'm going to um, start in Photoshop, and there's my layer, and I'll make a copy of it. And right now, let's see. I think I'll just label this Remask for now. Um, Actually, what we'll probably do is this is going to be, we'll end up going into clarity. So let's see. But this is this is where the mask will appear, and we'll first work on the field part. But what I'm going to do is, it doesn't really matter what I labeled it here. I just have a layer selected. I'm going to go into remask. So Topaz Labs under the filter menu, and then go down to remask. So as you can see, if you haven't seen this before, Remask looks totally different from the other plugins. And the reason for that is we're not doing any adjustments to an image. All we're doing is masking. And the concept is actually just, is, is simple. The way it operates is deceivingly simple because it's this program does amazing masking and, and it, uh, it defies its uh, apparent simplicity. So, um, basically, you see there's this overall green cast. Green is for keep, red is for cut. So, um, and then the blue is the what they call the compute brush. So that's the transition. And what I when I'm basically um, these are navigation controls. These are the brushes, and these are fills. And I'll show you what those do in just a minute. So what I like to do is I go to the little magnify tool here. I like to work at one-to-one -one when I'm masking so I can be more precise, and I'm just moving it with the little navigation thing. Here, I'm going to go back to the overall so you can see. Basically, we have a pretty obvious line here for the foreground right along here, if you can see that little blue cross here going across the screen. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to use that as our masking line. And I'm gonna this. I'm gonna adjust my brush size here. So the idea here is you want a brush size that's gonna get on both sides of your line, just big enough to do that, and also give yourself a little leeway for for doing this. And actually, I'm gonna switch to my Wacom tablet because I find the masking is easier to do with a stylus. Now, you know you can just trace along here, but if you have a you can use a shortcut too. If you have a you know a straight line portion here like this. You can just go to your next spot, hold the shift key down and click, and it's it goes a lot faster if you have some straight line portions here. I'm just going to freehand it. Here's another nice straight line portion um, on top of the bushes here. And basically, I just want to make sure that I keep the blue, the, um, which is the compute brush, the transition brush over all of my transitions, like the trees here. And I'll go around these bushes. And actually, I could. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make, make sure that those are those are those are transitions. So make sure they're all covered in blue. And I think if you haven't seen this before, I think you're going to be pretty amazed at what a great mask this does. Because there's a lot of detail stuff where you know branches of trees and a lot of fine stuff that if you tried to do this mask in anything else. Um, like Photoshop, it would be very time consuming and a lot harder to do. So I'm going to go back to my overall view, make sure I have a complete line. So now this is where I'm going to use these fills. These are like a bucket tool. So red is is the um, is what we want to get rid of, and the green is the keep. And it really doesn't matter because we're going to use both use this mask both ways. So I'm just going to cut out the mist for now and leave the foreground, and then I just say compute over here and it's going to create a mask. Now, I like to use the split view just to examine the mask and see if I need any touch-up. So I'm going to do that. That's the upper right here. You can actually do four views if you want. I usually just use the split view. Now, they look the same, but you can choose what you want to do with each view. So on the right-hand side, I'll say keep, so it's showing the part we're keeping. It has that annoying checkerboard pattern in the background that you see in Photoshop. Um, if in the lower left here, you notice I just clicked on this thing that says solid color. Uh, Topaz allows you to do uh, a remask allows you to do a background color. You can do whatever color you want. If I want a different color, I can select one in here. Oops. <clears throat> so 
the yellow is fine, and I'm going to go back up to 100% so I can take a, take a look at this. And you can see um, how nice that mask turned out with all these trees and branches. And, you know, these are kind of translucent, and it kept all that. Um, and it's really easy to tweak the mask, too. Now, in this case, we're just dealing with mist, so it isn't that critical. But you notice that on the left, some more tools appeared. So a couple ways we could do this, we could take the, the edge hardness, move that up, and you'll notice where it was sort of gray in here before it got whiter. Here, I'll go back to the way it was. And you can see that it, if you use the color side, there's a little yellow spilling into there. So I can just harden the edge of that mask. Another way is to use this magic brush. So I can click on the keep brush, and it's kind of like shrink wrapping. It just You just touch the edge of it with the brush, and it kind of shrink wraps right to the edge. So this is a great way to just touch up this mask exactly how you want it. We got a little bit on the house here. And, you know, basically it's, a, it's the mask is perfect almost right out of the chute here. So I'm just going to say, okay. And now we've got our mask in here. So remember, black conceals, white reveals. So now we've got this set up so we can work just on the field. I'm going to go into clarity. So in clarity, I'll hit the reset. It looks like we're at our, um, we're at our neutral tone here. Now, I talked about presets before. If, if there are things that you do on a regular basis, I encourage you to make a preset out of it so you can reuse those. And, whoops, and uh, what I'm going to do here is I have it on my collection. So these are all presets that I've made. And I have these dehaze ones because I just run into that with landscapes. And just to give you an idea, and I'll show you what it's doing when I do it. So I'll click on the normal. And you can see right away that brought back a lot of detail in the foreground. In fact, I think that looks great. We'll actually need a little more on the background. So you can see I can click on the heavy, and that's way overkill. Actually, the mist looks okay, but probably a little overdone. And then in between, I have the plus. And that would probably be good for the mist. But for the foreground, what I call dehaze landscape normal, if you look over on the right, what it actually is is pretty simple. It's bringing the micro and low contrast sliders up about a third of the way. And then down below, it's bringing up the black levels so we don't, don't lose shadow detail. And uh, it's bringing down the white level a little bit. But in general, this is, you know, this is looking pretty good. Let me, let me enlarge it so you can see it a little better. Whoops. Uh, I'm in the wrong one. There we go. So at one to one here, it takes a little while for it to come up here. Um, I'll move it up so you can see the foreground. So now we're getting the detail and some texture and a sense of depth back in there. So there's my before. It's kind of flat looking. And there's the after. We've got that depth. And I'm going to say OK and bring that back into Photoshop. And if I magnify this a little bit, I can uncheck that layer. There's the before. And you see, because of the mask, it's only affecting the foreground. So when I do the after, this background is, remains unchanged. So now I'm going to um, duplicate my background layer again. And now we're going to work on the background, on the, on the mist. So I'm gonna, we're going to go right back into Clarity to do this, because that's the best tool for it. But now we're going to work on the mist, where we need a little more clarity adjustment than we had on the field. So. And I'll show you how we're going to deal with the mask. Actually, we can do that right now. I'll take this mask. You can do Option Drag. So you, you click on the mask with the Option key held down, Alt on a PC, drag it right down to that layer. Now we have the same mask there. And I know you're asking, well, we don't want the same mask. So I'm going to select that mask and just do Command or on a PC, Control-I for invert. And instantly, that inverts the mask. So now we can use this very same mask. We don't have to redo our all our work. It's all there. So I'm going to go to, um, I need to select my image first. Then I'm, I'm going to go to Filter, Topaz Labs, Clarity. And we'll jump right back into Clarity. I'm going to reset it. This time I'm going to go for a little more adjustment. 
So, and remember, visually, like when you're looking at this, you want to mentally ignore that foreground. What we're looking at right here is for the mist. And I'm going to magnify that a little bit so you can see it. And you can see there's the before, there's, there's, and the after. You can see there's actually a lot of sort of layering and texturing and, and subtle detail in that mist. And by and all all the heavier one does versus the one we had before is that third slide or the medium contrast. I brought that up a little. Now, you'll notice that my in my preset I have the white level to a negative, and the reason I do that is with a normal daylight exposure, you're going to start to lose highlight detail and shadow detail. So that's why I boost the blacks and bring down the whites. But in this case. Um, we don't have any extremes, and if you look at the histogram, in fact, we have a pretty compressed tonal range there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the blacks back down, and remember, we're just looking at the mist, and that's making this look a little better. And I'm actually going to go the other way with the whites because I want to boost this, boost that background up a little bit. And I'm even going to lighten the thing overall by a little bit by using the midtones. And again, remember, we're just... Yeah, it's a little bit much. Let's just, I'm just typing in numbers, which you can do. There's another way to do it. So now we've got, um, there's the before, there's the after. And now I think the mist in the background are looking good where they're going to balance nicely with everything else. And I'm going to. Well, I don't know what happened there. I somehow lost it. Let's see. All right, let's try that again. Now we should have our same settings in there from before. And in fact, we don't. So I will just redo it here very quickly. And we wanted to bring up our midtones to lighten it overall for the mist. Black level down, white level up. And say, okay, it's possible I hit um, it's possible I hit the cancel by mistake. So there we are. Um, if I click on that eyeball, there's the before for the mist, um, the before and after for the field. And the only thing I have left to do that I want to do is um, bring up this this villa a little bit. And what I can do is jump right back into Remask. And what I'm going to do is just I'll go up to 200% here so we can see a little bit because the villa is pretty small in this image. And I'll bring my brush size down a little bit. All I'm going to do here is just outline the villa because what happened is we lost that kind of nice warm glow that I saw when I was originally there. So um, we're just going to outline the villa here. Say compute mask. Oops, I have to do my cup, uh, keep, keep and cut. Compute my mask. And I can use my little magic shrink wrap brush here just to touch it up. Say OK. And what I'm going to do is just um, make a levels layer here and use the mask from that. I really don't need this extra image that just sort of takes up room in the file. And so once I'm once I'm in levels here, then I can go in, for instance, into the blue, and I can just adjust out the um, take some of that blue out of the villa and let me enlarge that so you can see it. So I just kind of come in here, that takes out a lot of the blue right there. It's looking a little greenish, so I can or cyanish, so I can go into the red, and I can adjust the 
red level as well, bring that up so it just looks a little warmer. And then I can go to the overall, the RGB, and just lighten it up a little bit by moving my slider this way. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I know what you're thinking is that that's overdone. And this is the same concept as before when I kind of overdid it. I can adjust the the opacity on here. So I'm just going to bring the opacity down to maybe 50%. So, and so there we are. We've got we've got our final image. Um, I'll jump back into Lightroom here so we can do a compare. So that's our before image that we're looking at, and there's our after. And there we are. Voila. All right, thank you all for attending. I really appreciate it and really enjoyed it, and, and I always appreciate you uh, attending. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, for the great feedback.